Welcome, everyone, to this Good Leadership Podcast. My name is Charles Good, your host and the president of the Institute for Management Studies. This podcast is designed to provide you with actionable insights and tools that you can use from discussing the research, stories, and background from recognized experts and practitioners to accelerate your impact in your current role. Well, welcome, everyone. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing an often underutilized and undervalued skill that every leader should be using more of, and that's storytelling. We're going to pack unpack some of the myths around it while giving you um, some great advice and tools so you can get better at this essential leadership skill. And for today's program, I've, as my guest is Ty Bennett, he's the owner and CEO of the largest Ninja Warrior gym in the world, and it's not stopping there. Soon he's going to have three Ninja Warrior gyms to add to his portfolio. He's also an active CEO and entrepreneur, has built three multi-million dollar businesses in three different industries. Him and his brother built a direct sales business to over $20 million in annual revenues while in their 20s. He has some of the most recognizable companies as clients in the world, such as Coca-Cola, Subway, Blue Cross Blue Shield, and Remax, a name but a few. And he's also a best-selling author of The Power of Influence and The Power of Storytelling, The Art of Influential Communication. Thank you, Ty. Welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Great. I loved our conversation last time on influence and its impact from your other book. Wanted to get you back on the program to talk more about a critical leadership skill that I think people aren't talking about enough. But before I do, I have to ask you, um, what got you interested in this topic on storytelling? Where did that passion come from? Or was there an inspiring mentor of yours that really kind of um, got you hooked into it? You know, so for me, it was uh, more of trying to dissect communication, what worked as uh, going back in my intro, you mentioned multiple businesses. My background is as an entrepreneur. And in my early 20s, when I was 21, my brother's 22, we started a business in direct sales. And to be honest, that did, business did not take off like a rocket. It didn't uh, have the growth right away that we wanted. And I had some good learning experiences where I had to recognize that I just wasn't moving people. I wasn't influential, right? I wasn't getting people to buy from me or to take action or to choose to do business with me. And so one, I, I did have a mentor who recommended that I record everything. And I don't know if you've ever done that, Charles. I, as people listen, it's an eye-opening and often painful experience to go back and listen to yourself. And I have listened to more recordings of myself than anybody should ever have to. It's, uh, I don't know if I'm a glutton for punishment or just not learning things that fast, but I started that at that age. and would go back and listen to all of my sales pitches, all my communication, all my interactions. And it was interesting, all of the things that I learned. But at one point, I remember asking the question, okay, what, what caused people to engage, right? If, if you and I were talking and I was pitching you, at the moments that you were leaning in, at the moments that you were laughing, that you were asking more questions, that I seemed to have you involved and captured in the conversation engaged, what was I doing? And often I was telling stories. And so that was like a a light bulb to me, like ding, ding, ding. Okay, let's hone in on that. And so I started to practice it. I started to read books. I started to to work on it. And as simple as this may sound, as I got better at it, our business got better. And so I, as that evolved, I used that skill for me. I kind of developed for myself, for my own use in the sales process and then in the leadership process. Then I began training our sales team uh, on some of those techniques. And then as I wrote my first book, as I started speaking to companies, I had a lot of people come up after I spoke and ask me if I could coach them or if there was any coaching available on presentation skills, on storytelling in particular. And that eventually led me to writing the book, The Power of Storytelling. It's the book I wish I had when I was 21 years old. Um, Maybe it's not the greatest book ever written on storytelling, but I think it's one of the unique books that dissects it as a skill and breaks it down and uh, gives you the formulas to use because I think it, anybody can understand those. Um, and it's interesting that the feedback that I typically get from people is one of two things. For those who don't feel natural in storytelling, it's often very eye-opening, right? As we break down specific formulas and different pieces, you're like, wow, I, I didn't realize that. That's interesting. There is a, a sequence to this and it makes sense. And for those who probably are pretty natural at it, they often go, I didn't realize I was doing that, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's an awareness to, oh yeah, I actually do some of that. Like, 
But once you understand it, then you can reapply it and you can hone it as a skill, right? So since I, I wrote that book, I've been able to share these concepts with, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people around the world and and break that down and help people with it. And um, sometimes on a one-on-one -on -one level, um, really like working on presentations and sometimes more specific to the principles around it. And, and so it, for me, I've come to realize that whoever tells the best story wins. I don't care what industry you're in. I don't care. Like the stories have a unique power over people. So that being said, why don't you think it's more utilized by leaders? What's the one thing that's really holding them back from using it more? I'm, I'm going to answer that with two things. Uh, one is I don't think that uh, leaders just like anybody else have developed the skill to a level that it's as effective as it could be often, right? Uh, for, for some reason, we often just take communication for granted. We think we should just, you know, be good at it. And we don't spend the time to practice it and hone it and develop it as a skill. So I think that's one reason. The other thing is I think that people think it takes too long, right? We're always in a hurry. We have a lot on our plate. There's a ton to try and communicate. And sometimes for the sake of being succinct or trying to get as much information as quickly as possible to our people, we miss the concept of being able to communicate that effectively in a way that is truly engaging and understood. And so, yeah, sometimes I think it's, it's put on the back burner because we feel like it's, you know, we don't have time for that. And, um, we could sit and argue it, but I, I think that it is one of the most underrated skills in business. Well, that's good to know because a lot of time I get from leaders, from people that I talk to, well, I'm just not a born storyteller. You know, it, it's just not the way I'm wired, but, but that's really not the case. It's a practice that can be learned and improved For over sure. time. For sure. And, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of people come up from more of like an analytical standpoint. Right. And, um, and so they look at facts and figures and I'm not saying those don't need to be there. I'm just saying they don't actually move people, right? If we're emotional beings, we move based on emotion and stories bring emotion into the conversation. And so can we make those facts and figures come alive? Can we add context to it? Can we add clarity to it? Um, that's what stories do. The other common question I get around people not utilizing it is I just don't have any good stories. Hmm. I don't know where they come from. I can't find them. What would you say to those individuals that say, I just, uh, my life is um, really not filled with any compelling stories? Well, a couple of things. One, I think sometimes simple stories are just as effective. We, we often think that it has to be this shock and awe, grandiose, you know, life altering uh, escaping death kind of story. And that does that's not ne necessarily the case. Like when I speak, I share story, all sorts of different stories. I share little interactive stories with my kids at, at the kitchen table. I share, you know, because those can be poignant too, uh, when used in the right place and, and for the right reasons. So one, I think we all have stories. If we pay attention, it's hard to be fully aware of those and to recognize those. Uh, but two, they don't have to just be our own experiences. I think the more personal the story is, the more powerful it becomes because it's uniquely yours. I can't steal your story, Charles, because you've experienced it, right? That's, that's yours to share. Uh, but we can find stories in a lot of ways. You can find stories from movies, from books, from articles, from uh, other people's experiences. We can beg, borrow, and steal, like all sorts of stories. So as an example... Uh, in our direct sales business, we sold certain products. And early on, um, what I would notice in is there'd be some story that would come out about the effectiveness of a key product, right? And kind of everybody would use that story until they had their own story, until they had their own experience, right? And then they can more personalize it and adapt and use their own story. But um, for the sake of having a story that highlights the effectiveness of that product, maybe that's where you start. Um, and, you know, you might not be in a situation where it's a product, but maybe it's, you know, the strategy that you're uh, laying out. Maybe it's as you're sitting down one-on-one -on -one and you're working through specific um, situations with one of your people and they're presenting, you know, this struggle, you might not have had a struggle with it, but maybe there's somebody else on the team who has, right? It doesn't have to necessarily be your story to, in every story that you tell. Great insight. So it starts with awareness. Let's turn to what really the focus should be. And I have a couple of great books that I've read and people that I've had on the podcast as well. I mean, one's um, 
um, talks about story a lot. And he says, you know, you always have to remind yourself that you and your brand, if it's a business, are not the focus of the story. Your audiences mm -hmm. are the focus. Your customers should be the focus or the center of your brand story, of your of your story that you're trying to tell. And, and I love his statement when he says, when you truly connect with your audience, you can craft irresistible brand stories that turn engagement into enthusiasm, into evangelism. So you, like you that. don't want customers, right? You want fans and stories are such a powerful way to do that. Well, one thing that we forget about and we don't even think about is just the simple fact that stories are memorable and easy to retell, right? So if we can create some of those brand stories that you hear it as a customer and you can go and retell that story, it, you then create some momentum. Uh, same thing happens with like a funny ad or something, right? Like if you can hold on to it and retell it, then it becomes a useful piece that gets some momentum and it has legs. You're right. One of the other th reasons that I've seen that makes stories so eff so effective is that people are less likely to argue against stories in an advertising campaign or a For claim, sure. right? Because it's harder to argue with someone's personal story or account. It may not be what you experienced, but it is what they experienced and perceived. What are some of the other reasons why stories work so well? Well, um, like I just mentioned, they're, they're memorable. Uh, they actually induce two specific chemicals in the brain, cortisol, which causes us to focus, right? So we pay attention and oxytocin, which is often called the trust hormone. There's a connection that kind of takes place in that. Um, and ultimately I think it's the emotion that invokes that causes you to want to take action, right? So if the story is to sell your product, if the story, whatever it is, it invokes that emotion that moves people. Um, and so, yeah, I think stories have a unique ability. I like the point that you made, you know, I can't argue your story. I can argue your experience. If you say this does, you know, this and it'll just lay out facts, I could argue that and go, okay, like prove it to me. But if you share your experience, then it's uniquely yours. And I just, we just kind of hear it and accept it. And there's, you know, we move forward with it. So there's so many reasons why we should use stories. Um, love to kind of dive into how they can be used in what ways, because if you're a leader, if you're a manager, a boss, an employee, a parent, a spouse, you know, there's always ways to put stories into your communication to make For you sure. more influential. And you, you list five different ways. I like to talk about maybe three or four of these because with anyone giving a speech, a presentation, and you and I have seen this a lot, you know, with my business, with your business, you kind of dread when that, when that speaker comes up and they start giving you an, an agenda or thanking everyone when they really should be opening with a compelling story, right? Yeah, I think that's one key piece is, right, it grabs people's attention right away. It's a great way to start. It's a great way to end. Uh, you know, you leave them with something that it has some emotional connection to it, right? You leave them with hope. You leave them with uh, some kind of call to action and stories can kind of envelop that. But I think um, it can also be used to either introduce or validate a point. So, you know, that could be like, here's the strategy that I'm laying out. And I could tell you this is the strategy and then I could give you a story of how it is. Or I could use the story to introduce the strategy. It just kind of depends on the setup. Or if it's a product that you're introducing and then you use a kind of a testimonial type story of, you know, we introduced this product and my mom was the first to use it and this is her experience or whatever it is. Um, and so I think we can use those from that standpoint is there's a validation piece to it. Uh, I also think that sometimes we, you can use stories to um, deal with objections, right? Uh, as people want clarity or they have confusion or they have questions, concerns around any specific thing. Uh, I think stories can shed light on it. They can give context to it, right? And so uh, in a, if we dive into like where exactly, um, that's like how you would use a story. But I think leaders use them in a lot of senses. I think we use them in one-on-one -on -one conversations, right? To share personal experiences, to connect, to, to share a, a new concept or kind of change a thought process of like, okay, you're butting up against this. Maybe if you thought about it this way, I had an interesting experience, you know, and, and you can paint a picture and help them see kind of a new idea, a new strategy. We can use them in the sales process, obviously. We can use them in training. We can use it as we introduce new ideas. Stories teach extremely well. Uh, you know, you mentioned as a parent, I, I have five kids and I find myself constantly sharing stories. Some are my own personal stories or other things that I see, but 
uh, there's such a good teaching moment. Um, and so, yeah, I think we should, as leaders, we should be constantly on the lookout for stories to use in the context of the conversations we're having. I agree with you and really using less of those facts and figures and statistics or putting it and weaving it within a story is so much more effective. I like how you mentioned handling objections because you have a good framework for that, that feel, felt, found framework. Love for you to unpack just a little bit for our listeners, just for them to uh, be able to use that tool and understand. Yeah, I, I think in sales training, this is something that, you know, I was taught years ago. I don't know who first it developed it. I don't know, Brian Tracy or somebody, uh, but it basically sets up a story, right? Where, uh, you know, Charles, you say, okay, but what about this? And say, okay, yeah, I, I understand how you feel. Uh, in fact, many people, uh, when we first introduced this, have felt that same way. But this is what we found. It leads me right into a, a story, right, that I can share, whether that's my own experience or somebody else's experience with it. Wonderful. Love that framework. And that's a nice way to kind of position a story and then leads you into a story after an objection by someone else. The one thing uh, that really stood out with me in the book are a couple things. Um, one, and I've heard you say this in your presentations as well in your programs, is that you don't retell a story, you relive a story. And there's really a couple of things that you need to be mindful of as you're trying to relive a story. And I love for us to go through each one of these three because I think they're so impactful. They're in some cases maybe common sense, but as we know, common sense isn't common practice. So the first thing that you mentioned about you don't retell a story, you relive it, is that you need to place your audience into the scene. How do you go about doing that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if I relive a story, you're more likely to relive it with me. And so I want you physically there. I can physically place you in the scene one of two ways. I can say, imagine being here, right? I want to engage you, like let you sit in it and see it. Or I can say, if you had been there, when? And just by physically placing you there, like I'll just give you an example, Charles. We're talking to leaders. Um, you know, I could say, I don't know if you've ever had to interview somebody before, but I remember the first time I had to interview somebody, I was so nervous. And if you'd been sitting in my office with me, I'm sitting behind my desk. I'm, my knees are shaking. The person's walking in. I'm in an interview. I still don't know what I'm going to say. I'll just pause right there. What are you picturing? Right? Like you're starting to see at the desk. Like all I had to do is one little line of text where I said, if you had been sitting in my office with me. And so if I can put you there, then you can start to kind of co-create the scene around you and visually start to see it. And so it becomes more real. And you also encourage people to use more you language instead of mm -hmm. I. So instead of saying, I was standing on my back porch, instead say, if you had been standing with me on my back porch. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even adding to that, I think there's a way to create curiosity, um, which is, I think is an important part of this. Instead of just jumping in and saying, like, let me tell you my story, because whether it's conscious or subconscious, you kind of don't care uh, if it's just about me. So how do I make it about you? And just ask like a simple you focus question, right? And, you know, we're talking, say, have you ever had this experience? And you're like, yeah, actually all the time. Well, it's interesting because, and boom, now I'm bringing you into the story. So the technique is I'm going to use that you focus language, but make it a question. I'm going to tap into your world with a question. And then I'm going to bring you into my world with a story. So you lead off with that question, mm -hmm. it's, say it's a presentation, and then that leads into a, to a story so that you avoid at the beginning of your presentation, your talk of just trying to go through all the facts. It's, it's really getting them engaged from the start. So you have an engaged, fully attentful audience versus an audience that really uh, may not be connecting. And it's, as you and I both know, it's so much harder to get them to connect midway through anything than it is if you just started out and grab their attention. And it makes it feel conversational, right? It's not me talking at you. It's me talking with you. The, if the question hits and you go, you engage with that in a positive way, then the story has relevance in your life, right? It's not just talking about my life. Now we're talking about our life and our shared experience. So you place them in the scene, you've created curiosity. How do you reinforce the relatability so that they feel like they can connect in a deeper way with you? I think this is having a conversational tone in the way that you speak, constantly kind of throwing it back on the audience. Um, and it's interesting, the, the example I just gave you a minute ago when I just was messing it up a second ago, of like a story about interviewing for the first time. I did this a few times where I said, I don't know if you've ever had to interview somebody before. It's just those little relatable statements. It's like for a second, I'm, I'm telling the story, but just for a second, I'm going to like break the third wall like and talk to directly to the audience right and just go 
have you ever had that happen before? What would you do in that situation? Like, and just maybe a couple of times. So it feels natural and conversational. And there's a touch point to make sure that the story is being reinforced to them. If you and I were one-on-one -on -one and we're just sitting here talking, there's probably a point in certain stories that I could say, isn't that just like the situation you're describing? Like, like truly reinforce it to exactly what you're going through. Now in a bigger group, you may not be able to be as specific. It might be more general in how you reinforce that. But the idea is that you're, you're touching base to make sure that they're following, that they're with you and that that story connects. And overall, you want to make it more of a dialogue versus just a monologue. For sure. Right? For sure. Yeah. Well said. So moving to the three parts of an influential story, um, it's the setup, it's the struggle, it's the solution. And I love how you say that the solution, um, you know, to overcome maybe the struggle that has an idea, a strategy, a product. But remember that if your struggle is relatable to the audience and the solution is going to be credible, and the hero is going to gain credibility, which is, I think, a really a key point in this whole influential story setup and structure. Yeah. I think sometimes we miss the idea that the story should be struggle to solution. The struggle is the relatable piece, right? Um, and especially in business, we kind of want to just come across as like, we've got it all together. We've figured it all out. Uh, and so we present solution to solution stories, which are not very relatable. One, because they're not true. Uh, and two, because Nobody cares. There's no emotional connection there, right? I mean, think about a business story. Most of them sound the same. You know, brand stories, we say, you know what, we're great. We've always been great and we'll always be great. And if you work with us, that'd be great, right? Like what is, what's real? Like you exist in business to solve problems. And as a leader, you haven't always had it figured out either. Um, you know, your product is, exists because there is some kind of struggle. I don't care what you sell, product or service. That's why it exists, right? Um, and so- being able to connect to that and to the pain or the change that people want to make, the motivation that they have, when they connect to that, then then they're going to kind of beat down your door for whatever that solution may be. And that's where the, the story becomes really uh, effective. So it's making sure, too, that you're not spending too long on the setup, that yeah. you provide the context, you set the scene. You introduce the characters, but then you throw them into a struggle as quickly as possible. Well, if the struggle is the hook, right, then you want to get to the hook pretty quickly. And so there's some basic things you might have to set up for it to make sense. Um, so I'll give you just an example. I, a story that I've told for years that's just kind of funny, relatable. I fly a lot. I travel all the time. And because I fly on Delta, I'm based in Salt Lake City. I get upgraded to first, first class virtually every time I fly. So I tell a story about getting upgraded to first class and interacting with a jerk. What I just told you is the only context that is relevant for that story. You have to know that I fly a lot and I get upgraded for free. That's the setup. Because otherwise, the next part of the story, when you get into the struggle, it doesn't make sense. But all the other information, I just want to get there as quick as I can, right? And so if there's certain elements that need to be there, introduce main characters, whatever, you do that and then you throw them into the struggle because then people start to really pay attention when the struggle hits and there's an emotional connection. Well, I love that story. I wouldn't, hopefully you wouldn't mind just giving the listeners kind of the full yeah. story of it and kind of see that struggle and solution because it really sets <laughs> up well for all three pieces yeah. of it. Well, so I was flying to um, Oakland, California, Bay Area, quick, painless, about an hour and a half flight. I was upgraded that day. I was seated in seat 4B. And I think I was the first person who came on the plane. I came in and sat down. I wasn't paying attention as other people were coming on the plane. And all of a sudden, this gentleman stopped next to me and he goes, get up, you're in my seat. And he said it pretty aggressively. I looked up and I said, what? And he said, get up, you're in my seat. And I looked up and I went, okay, I'm sorry, what seat are you in? And he goes, this is first class. Do you realize this is first class? You're in my seat. <laughs> um, do you love people like that? I just was like flabbergasted. And I looked up and I said, yes, I realize this is first class. I'm also seated in first class. What seat are you in? And then he asked me what I still believe is the dumbest question I've ever heard in my entire life. He goes, did you pay to sit in first class or did you just get upgraded? Because I paid for my first class seat. <laughs> So I answered him. I said, I got upgraded, which really stinks for you because that means I paid a lot less money for the exact same seat. I said, what seat are you in? And he goes, I'm in 4C. <laughs> and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I said, this is 4B. This is my seat. 
before C is right there across the aisle. And without any hesitation, any apology or anything, he just turns and he sits down in his seat. And I'll be honest, I'm usually pretty good. I don't get really ruffled by people, but at this point I was ticked. And I turned, I looked at him and I go, you know what? You would suck at what I do. And he goes, what? And I go, I didn't stutter. I said, you would suck at what I do. And he goes, why is that? And I said, because you're not good with people. You are horrible with people. Just be nice. It's not that hard. And he looked at me like with this shock look like no one had ever told me as a jerk before. I, I shared that story to an audience recently. And this woman in the front row goes, no, his ex-wife told him he's a jerk. I'm sure of it. Uh, <laughs> but you think about that, right? Like there, if we we're just break down that story structure, um, there's a little bit in the setup that you need to know. Just that I get upgraded for free, that I was seated in seat 4B. And we might get into this later, but when you get into detail, specific things like that make it more tangible, right? You need to know that I'm in 4B for the story to make sense. And so he comes in. As soon as we introduce the him as the character, we'll call him the jerk in 4C. I don't know what his name is. Uh, you know that this is a man versus man conflict because of the tone that he takes, which is me. Think about that. I'm the storyteller. And so I'm using dialogue. I didn't tell you about it. I'm reliving it as if I'm the jerk saying it, and then I'm responding, right? Um, and if I was standing on a stage, there'd be some other elements that come into play in terms of posture, um, hand gestures, other things like that, that you're not seeing in this version of it. But this the struggle is introduced, and then that conflict kind of escalates, gets bigger and bigger because of the back and forth, the exchange, right? And then it's finally relieved. Um, that is a struggle to solution story. And we all have those. I mean, think about any bad inner. And, and here's an interesting thing, Charles, you asked me a question before of like, when people say I don't have any good stories. Sometimes if you approach it from the stand, asking the question, what's a good story that I've experienced, that's really hard to come up with. But if you were to sit down and approach it from like, where have I had struggle? That's actually a really good exercise. Like man versus man struggle, bad customer service, bad interaction, tough relationships, uh, where like arguments, like uh, been treated poorly, et cetera. Now, the reality is not every struggle has a solution and therefore not every struggle creates a good story, but every story has a good struggle. And so sometimes retaining that, and we also retain bad experiences better than good experiences. I don't know why that is in our brain. We just do. Um, well, I do know why it's heightened cortisol. Uh, when you have a bad experience, you have five times the amount of cortisol pumped into your system than you do when you have a good experience, the amount of oxytocin pumped into your system. Our brains are wired to protect us and therefore we hold on to negative experiences more. But because of that, we can lean into that and try and use that to identify the stories that work. That's a great insight with the struggle. Just identify the struggle. You list five different types of struggle, the man versus man, and you, and you give examples of different movies. I mean, that could be Rocky, man versus nature could be twister so that it gives you that framework to say okay now i can see where maybe i would have a story where like you were saying before i just don't have any great stories but this provides i think a more um more compelling or just more relatable framework that they can say yeah i can see where some of my stories might fit into some of these um struggle um, i also think art. sometimes we are dismissive of our own experiences like i've done enough of this coaching other people that I can hear someone's story and the way they tell the story, they're just like, well, it's just like a normal interaction. I could retell that story and make it a story that they're like, well, that sounds amazing. But I, often it's because we just don't put much weight in our own experience, right? Like we lived through it, not a big deal. And yet somebody else has something very similar and like, holy cow, that's pretty amazing. And so uh, some of it is, is to be able to identify, you know, what we've been through and and the real learning experience that we have, uh, the awareness piece is hard, right? For a lot of people, it's it's hard to recognize that. And so sometimes you do need some outside input and some other people to to help coach that along and and for to help you see it. I agree with you, definitely do, and that's really helped me along the way as well. I'd like to move now into some of those tools that you give, which are some really great tools in this book that provides this structure to help people. Um, create these compelling stories. And the first are the two C's that make stories more compelling. It's curiosity, which we've kind of touched on because mm -hmm. um, every good story engages the audience with curiosity by creating questions that the 
that are in the audience's mind, questions that will be answered by the time the story ends, hopefully. But characters, we really haven't gone into much. Perhaps you can give us some more insight around characters. And I love the story on your mom and the story that you created with her with the Galvanic Spa when you and your brother were first starting the business. And you needed credibility and you wanted to make sure that the character fit the intended audience that you were going after. Yeah, so I think um, giving some insight to the characters and then bringing them to life, right? Using some of the other tools, whether that's, uh, you know, dialogue, giving them a voice or uh, to personify them, like there's almost an act out, right? Certain posture, certain, uh, I mean, if you can do an accent, great. I can't, I'm not that talented, but like, anything like that that kind of makes that character come alive. But in certain situations, the right characters can be the connection point, right? So what you referenced, um, we had a, a device that we sold early in our business that was a- angled at middle-aged women. I'm not the target audience, right? Like, And so I'm not, I can't connect. I don't have a level of credibility there. And so I thought about, okay, who's literally when that product came out, I was like, who is the person I'm closest with in that target audience? It was my mom. So I sent her one. I was like, hey, you need this product. You need to try it out because one, I want to see how it works. And and then from there, I could use her story and that character for her to be the connection point, right? So if I'm talking to in that situation, the target audience, a middle-aged woman, I can say, you know what? My mom had an amazing experience with that. And let me tell you, and my mom becomes the connection, right? Because they connect to the character. Sometimes people connect to different things in a story. It could be the struggle, could be the character. It could be you as the storyteller. Like there's lots of different connection points. And so thinking thoroughly through that and being strategic about it makes a lot of sense. And many times your characters are the strongest connection to Mm -hmm. your audience. For sure. So you have to identify those correctly. And it's not you being the connection point. It's you identifying the right character to connect in with the audience. And one thing I love how you say at the end of this um, section is, is really it's if you can step back after you've told the story and ask yourself, how was it delivered? How was it received? You're gonna be light years ahead of most people because they're looking at, what did I say it correctly? They're not even looking at and thinking about the connection with the audience, which is really what it's all about. Well, go back to, you made a point earlier in this conversation that the focus of a story is about your audience, right? If that's the case, then we have to ask different questions both before and after stories in our assessment of them. It's not, did I say word for word what I wanted to say? It's did that connect and why, what connected so that I can focus there. And if it didn't, why did I mess it up? Did I approach it totally wrong? Did I stumble through it? Was there a major distraction in the room set up? Like there's, there could be a million reasons why, but yeah, I think if our focus is the, on the audience, then we approach it and assess it from that vantage point. So great. And what you said earlier makes so much sense too. in recording yourself. It's Mm -hmm. really difficult to do. It's humbling. But it's the one way that's going to improve your performance, probably more so than anything else right from the start, if you honestly look at it and and critique it the right way so that you can improve over time. This is what I do for a living. I mean, literally, I speak to companies and audiences all over the world. I have for 13 plus years. This is the main thing that I do. I also teach storytelling as probably the main topic that I speak on. And so I'm dissecting this. And I still listen to myself after every speech. Like I walk through the airport with my AirPods in, I'm listening to the speech that I just gave. And sometimes I'm still amazed, like, what? like why? And just there's little tweaks along, hopefully over time they become smaller and smaller tweaks, right? But sometimes I'm like, holy cow, that whole section, like that's a disaster. But that's the work, right? That's That's how you get better at anything, right? If I were a basketball player, I would be after a game studying game film. That's what you do, right? And you dissect it and you go, okay, I need to apply this here and like this scheme, like that's what, and so if you're going to master something, that's how you approach it. You're right. And getting that practice, getting that feedback is so critical and just being able to give it um, as well as receive it is um, equally critical. If you um, are recording yourself, if you're having someone else watching it, I know you advocate for role-playing as well with other people. So they give you. Um, advice and critiques um, on what you did well and what you didn't do that well so that you can improve over time. Let's move into the two Ds that make stories dynamic. Just um, maybe we can focus on one of them and that's um, it's dialogue and details. Dialogue is so critical because you don't want it to turn into a monologue, but how do you create 
dialogue in your stories and what's the right balance? I think uh, understanding one, the importance of a dialogue just brings a story to life. It brings a character to life. It, bring, it puts it in present tense. You're no longer narrating a past experience. You're reliving it. Uh, Mark Twain said it well. He said, don't tell me that the lady screamed. Bring her on stage and let her scream. Uh, so dialogue has two main purposes. It's used for impact and humor. So when you want something to be funny, like if you study humor, and, and I'll just give you this idea. Humor can be learned, but if you're not really going to dive into it, if you're not funny, don't lean into it. If you are, lean into it. But dialogue in humor is a huge piece. But for more often than not, it's impact lines, right? So the key takeaway line, the lesson from the mentor, the key idea from the customer's experience, the, the feedback that they gave you, whatever, like, can you put that in dialogue? Can you allow the character to say it? Because it's almost third party validation. I get that you're the storyteller and you're actually saying it. But when I tell you the story and I allow dialogue for that character to say it, all of a sudden I'm not saying it, right? If I am talking to you and I'm like, Charles, you know, when you told me and you're, I'm, I'm giving your words validity. And so I tell stories like I had mentors of mine who taught me lessons uh, that I give them a voice. I have you know, in that story, we met reference from my mom. I give my mom a voice to here's the results she had in her voice, right? Instead of me just saying it uh, and we could go on and on, but ultimately that's, that's the idea is that you allow characters to say it. Well, I love the one story that you give um, about one of your mentors, Stephen Covey and putting it in his voice about the advice he's giving you um, in your first meeting with him, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you know, whether it's him or anybody else, allowing that impact line to come from him is so much more powerful than somewhere else. Right. The other D is details. And there's three main areas that you want to look at in terms of adding details to the story. And you say that's location. Um, it's in amounts, quantities, and time. And you give a great story in the book. Um, and I've heard you say it on stage as well about Mel Fisher mm -hmm. and his story that really kind of builds all these elements in. I'm sorry. Uh, I think that um, the idea behind details is, is to make something tangible, right? To grab onto it. Uh, Mel Fisher was the greatest treasure hunter the world has ever known. Uh, he discovered the treasure of the Atocha off the Florida Keys worth over $400 million. It's crazy. The unbelievable story. But I'll just give you this, this idea. Think about it. When he discovers the treasure of the Atocha, the way that I tell it is I say one day a magnometer indicated something down on a seabed and two divers dove down to see what they had found. And they found they were sitting on an entire reef of silver bars. <laughs> Can you imagine? They, they found 700 silver bars that weighed 70 pounds a piece. They found 2,500 emeralds, 3,500 other gems, hundreds of pounds of heavy gold discs, bits, and chains, thousands of artifacts, cannons, all sorts of things. Estimates put the Rex Valley at over $400 million. Or wow. I could have said they just found a really big treasure, right? Like those details paint a picture. You can see it. You can touch it. It sure. becomes real. And so that's where those details step up. That's where those details become more important. Um, and, and because of that, I think details are, are an important piece that we sometimes miss. And we think we're now, there's, there's places where details don't need to be there. Uh, there's unnecessary details. But details that you can grab onto, they're going to help somebody to solidify it in their mind. Great stuff. The location, especially what you mentioned earlier with um, just setting that scene of, of where it's located. Don't tell them that they're in a hotel in Las Vegas. Tell them they're at room 302 in Caesars Palace. Put them into the scene and provide those details that really help them do that. And, and even with time and that Mel Fisher story, you stated that his wife broke the record for being underwater. And, and you just didn't say it was, you know, for a long time, it was 55 hours, 37 minutes, 11 seconds. So they felt more impact because of that. And it really yeah. drew them in. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's funny. Some of the details we gloss over that just have more impact, right? Like uh, any of those, like I hear that you just saying that, right? 55 hours. It, just listen to the difference of she did this for a long time. Versus she stayed underwater for 55 hours, 37 minutes, and 11 seconds. Like all of a sudden you're like, 
what would you do? Like it's making me think, it's it's connecting me, it's engaging me. Um, a long time means nothing, right? Like, okay, great. Uh, and so it's just something that it's a missed opportunity for connection with the audience when you don't use it. Now, how do you know which one or how much is enough or if it's really connecting? Is it just through trial and error, having that feedback, watching it and saying, well, the audience really, I gave them probably too much detail. They were getting disengaged versus maybe not giving them enough because I really wanted to accentuate this part. Um, so I'm going to answer that with a yes and a no. Uh, storytelling is an art, right? That you can understand the science, but it is an art. And even your voice, Charles, is going to be different than my voice, different than anybody else's. And so you might tell a story a little bit differently than I do, but it works for you. Uh, so there is a lot of it is trial and error, but not just with an individual story trial and error. There's that, right? Where I'm going to tell a story three or four times before I feel like, okay, I think I've honed it pretty well. But then through the course of doing that and being aware of it, I'm also finding my voice in storytelling where I then can get better at other stories because I'm a better storyteller. I, I understand. So the trial and error can actually be catapulted into other stories and used as a reference point. Um, and so I think it speeds up the learning curve. Thank you. That's great advice. Before we end, I want to just touch upon um, one of the two M's. So the final piece is the two M's that make stories memorable. That's movement, which is really a lot of that um, has impact when you're live and in person, but mm -hmm. metaphors, I think people really struggle with. And I think it's so important to use figurative language to connect the audience into what you're saying, especially if it's something unfamiliar with them. Absolutely. If you can compare the known to the unknown, right? If you're presenting a concept that's hard for people to get around. And when I say metaphors, I'm not necessarily saying like, you can't be a simile, you can't use like or as like, I'm just saying analogies, right? Um, but uh, yeah, some some concepts and some stories need metaphors. And I think great communicators take complex ideas and they make them simple. And metaphors are a great tool to do that. So yeah, where where that's needed, that's a, an incredible tool to add into a story. And the metaphor-based story, you know, worked like magic for you to establish credibility when you found, you know, that you're going to compare yourself to Bill Gates when you were starting out. So people didn't just look at your age as something that was a deterrent from wanting to, to uh, buy from you, right? Yeah, for me, I recognized that uh, when I was 21 and I looked probably 12, people weren't taking me seriously just based off of my age. And so I, it was a, an objection I had to address. And from the way I figured out how to do that was a metaphor-based story where I could say, you know what, if you remember Bill Gates was 19 when he dropped out of school and people thought he was crazy. And then like literally owning it. I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to be as rich as Bill Gates is. I'm not saying I'm going to change the world the same way Bill Gates has, but I, I do know that I have something here and I'm asking you to take a serious look. And so that comparison, you know, comparing me, the unknown entrepreneur to Bill Gates, the known entrepreneur, that metaphor worked uh, because I was confident in the way that I approached it because I could build that out. Um, and truly, if you look back in my career, that story was a turning point for me. That story is the reason we're having this conversation today. Um, that's where I gain or glean the power of storytelling in my life uh, because of the trajectory change that that story made. And, and so, yeah, I think stories for all of us, we can find that right story and be able to use it in a way that truly makes a difference. Thank you, Ty. As we close this episode, uh always want to leave my listeners with something that they can use right away. Is there one piece of advice that we've covered or maybe haven't covered that can start anyone on this storytelling journey and get them to become better storytellers? Well, I think just, you know, listening into this, I think is great. Um, and obviously there's research that needs to happen, dive into it, read books, et cetera. Uh, but this is a practice. This is a skill and you have to practice it. You're not going to become a great communicator by just listening to a podcast. Uh, unfortunately, I wish we could. Uh, but if you'll go out and practice it and understand, like, I'm trying to hone this skill, uh, the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. Wonderful advice. Thank you, Ty, for being a part of this episode. Remind our listeners how they can get in contact with you. Pretty easy to find tybennett.com, um, Ty Bennett on most social media platforms. Uh, yeah, just look me up. Love to connect.
If you enjoyed this episode, I encourage you to share with others and post about it on social media. You can also go to our YouTube channel, which has video recordings of all the episodes of this podcast, along with bite-sized segments called single servings that are designed to answer your most pressing leadership and management questions. Remember, until next time, it's not what you know that counts, but what you do consistently that makes a difference.